welcome to season four of National Parks Presents. I, season four, guys. We have hit the ground running and we're never looking back. Uh, today is our first of eight presentations that will take place every other Wednesday evening uh, from now until the end of April. Um, it's going to cover a whole multitude of topics, um, some including um, the Boston Public Library programming theme of revolutionary music. Some's just going into our wonderful history of Boston as well, like today, which is revolutionary Boston, um, all about Henry Knox and the siege. But before we get into the awesome stuff that Maria is going to talk about, we got to get into the boring Zoom features and then you'll get me off your screen. Uh, lucky for you, we are recording. So if you're like, hey, oh no, I need to go. My dinner's on fire. I need to go get my dinner. Uh, we are going to be on YouTube. All right. Give us about a weekish to get it up. It's not going to be immediate, but this presentation as other past ones and future ones will be on our YouTube page. Uh, you can find that by Googling Boss Public Library YouTube and you'll find the playlist. It's the National Parks playlist. Um, if you can see at the bottom, there might be some words appearing. We have the captions enabled, but if you don't enjoy them, you can absolutely turn them off. Just hit the CC button below and hit hide subtitles. Um, as Ranger Maria goes through her amazing presentation, I'm sure you're going to have all sorts of questions. You're going to be like, oh, that's a great point. Or, ooh, what about this? Some even asked early questions, which we do have, and it's really awesome. Um, but if you have a question, just hit the chat button and you're gonna type your question in the chat, you can send it to the host and panelists, which is everyone you see on the screen, um, or you can send it to everyone. And then everyone at home as well will also read your question. Uh, don't be shy, we love questions um, and we love people chatting. We just ask you to be respectful. Um, if we're not respectful, unfortunately it gets taken away. So let's keep our chat open. Uh, Ranger Sean, if you've been with us in the past, you've seen him. He's absolutely amazing. Uh, and he's moderating the chat. So he'll keep track of your questions and he'll pop on the screen um, to ask them to Major Maria. Um, before you leave tonight, there is a survey that hopefully will pop up on the screen. Um, if you could take it, that would be really cool because this is how we keep going. And this is also how we find other topics to to share with you guys, because um, it's not what Karen Rosales wants, it's what you guys want. <laughs> um, so without further babbling from me, let's welcome Ranger Maria Cole as she presents Revolutionary Boston, Henry Knox and the Siege. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. Um, hello, everyone. I can't see you because I can only see my slides, um, <clears throat> but that's okay. That's what's important for the moment. Um, feel free to put it into the chat uh, where you're zooming in from and um, how you find out about the program. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the program and then get into my slides. Um, this presentation was created originally for um, a Henry Knox Symposium that was hosted by the Friends of Springfield Armory. And it was a whole panel of, of people, of presenters, um, who were each taking different pieces of uh, Henry Knox's life. Um, and I was um, <clears throat> focusing just on the siege of Boston itself. So there isn't a whole lot of information in here uh, about who he is and how he grew up and that sort of thing. And there actually isn't a whole lot of information about uh, the noble train of artillery because one of the other presenters was from Fort Ticonderoga and he was covering that. So I have added a couple slides um, since then to kind of fill, to kind of fill that gap. Um, you can see Mr. Knox on the screen there in his um, in his uh, Continental Army uh, uniform there. And this is one of the younger images um, that we have of General Knox. Usually when I'm doing a presentation, we're in the resource itself. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this slide more so than some of the others. Um, hopefully some of you are familiar um, with these resources. Um, so over here, I don't know, can you see my cursor moving around? Um, this is what was Boston proper over in the center left-hand side of the screen. Uh, just above Boston proper was the Charlestown Peninsula. 
and that is where the Battle of Bunker Hill will take place. And then um, throughout the, the story, the siege, um, a number of other batteries were built in what was uh, then known as um, Charlestown. Today, we call it either Somerville or Cambridge. Um, down here on the south side is where the bulk of our story is taking place. So this is um, the Dorchester Peninsula, which today we tend to call Dorchester Heights and is actually in what today is known as South Boston. And then another big part of our story takes place here in the Heights of Roxbury. This large fortification in the lower right, uh, in the lower left hand corner is Fort Hill in Roxbury. And you can see Roxbury and Boston are connected just by a very narrow strip of land um, known as Boston Neck or Roxbury Neck, depending on which side you're approaching from. And you'll notice that there's some fortifications on the Roxbury side, and there's also fortifications on the Boston side. And in between is a little bit of a, of a no man's land. Um, <clears throat> the castle on Castle Island, which is where Fort uh, William is located. Today, this is connected um, through landfill. And, and in the time of our story, Castle Island really was an island. <laughs> and then the other thing I want to point out, um, well, actually, just another little side over here, Noddles Island, that's basically where the airport is located today. And then this a thin line that goes right through the center. This was the main shipping line. And so um, any ship coming in from the ocean, um, so coming from New York, coming from England, coming from North Carolina, coming from the Caribbean, this is how they would enter into the harbor in order to get to the port of Boston itself. And notice how close the high ground of Dorchester Heights is located to that main shipping line. So any ship that comes into Boston to bring supplies or troops or a British Navy vessel has to go under the high ground of Dorchester. Um, and so that's just kind of a lay of the land in a resource that's called uh, Boston and the environs of the harbor with the rebel work. So, so all of these notations are various locations where uh, the rebels, which would be us, the Continentals, um, have built fortifications, have built, um, have built readouts, have built forts, have built barracks, have, have uh, basically built up something that puts Boston under siege. And in Boston is the British Army, which I'll refer to as the regulars, and um, and as soon as the Battle of Lexington is over, Lexington and Concord is over on April 19, 1775, uh, many of the Loyalists who were living in the countryside moved into Boston, and many of the uh, patriots, like Knox and Revere, um, will be leaving Boston and moving out into the countryside. So this narrow land strip becomes, uh, for a very brief moment of time, a very busy highway with the Loyalists moving into Boston and the Patriots moving out of Boston. And so the siege of Boston uh, will last 11 months from April 19, 1775 to March, 6, uh, March 17, 1776. Throughout the siege, there are, are a series of small skirmishes um, <clears throat> and they, they kind of spring up out of nowhere and there's a lot of tension and a lot of anxiety and a lot of running around. <laughs> and then things tend to uh, quiet down very quickly. You may recognize the church. This is the first church of Roxbury, which is located in John Elliott Square, just in the shadow of Fort Hill. And here we have from May 14, from the diary of Samuel Bix Bixby. Last Sunday, the meeting house was full of soldiers, and news came that the regulars were landing on Dorchester Point. The general ordered the drums beat to arm, and soon as the drums sounded, the soldiers were out of the meeting house in a twinkle of an eye. We paraded and marched to Dorchester Neck, as it was said that the enemy was landing from the castle. It proved to be false alarm, and we returned to our quarters, where we were ordered to lie by our arms through the night. 
So for this particular incident, it turned out to be a, a whole lot of nothing. A few days later, we have Abigail Adams um, writing to her husband, John, down in Philadelphia about something, again, that stirred up very quickly. Alarm flew like lightning and men from all parts came flocking down to 2,000 were collected. But it seems their expedition was to Grape Island for the Leverett's Hay. There it was impossible to reach them for want of boats, but the sight of so many persons and the firing at them prevented their getting more than three ton of hay, though they had carted much more down to the water. At last they mustered a lighter and a sloop from Hingham, which had six portholes. Our men eagerly jumped on board and put off for the island. As soon as they perceived it, they being the regulars, uh, they decamped. Our people landed upon the island and in an instant set fire to the hay, which with the barn was soon consumed about 80 tons, it is said. So you can see there's a number of small skirmishes going on. Um, there, were, there were stealing of sheep and cow from various islands and that sort of thing as, um, as both armies are trying to get enough uh, resources and fodder and fuel to last through what at this point is a siege of undeterminate time. June 17 is the bloodiest day of the siege. This of course is the day of the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, I could talk for about an hour about the Battle of Bunker Hill, but that's not the focus of our program today. Um, so I will not do that. Um, but the Battle of Bunker Hill takes place on the Charlestown Peninsula, June 17, 1775. Um, the uh, provincials suffer about 450 casualties. And remember, casualties um, are both um, killed and wounded. So not everyone is necessarily dead. Um, and the regulars, the British regulars, um, suffer a very high number. Um, uh, 1,054 regulars were casualties. That's about a 47% casualty rate, which is extremely high. This particular uh, painting shows um, shows the mortal wounding of um, Major Pitcairn on the regular side and of Joseph Warren, uh, one of our provincial leaders on the on the provincial side. So our story really begins on this day. <laughs> um, Henry Knox is a newlywed. He's been married for just about a year at this point in time in July of 1776. And he's writing a letter to his wife, Lucy Flucker Knox. Um, Lucy was the daughter of the Royal Secretary, Secretary Flucker, who uh, was an incredibly influential person uh, in, the, in the royal government of Massachusetts. So when she was um, a young woman, she kind of had her choice of men and her choice of men was Henry Knox, um, which her father was not particularly thrilled with, not because he was a patriot and they disagreed on politics that hadn't really come up while they were courting. It was more because um, his father died when he was very young and the family didn't have a whole lot of resources. And um, one of Lucy's uncles basically convinces her father and says, listen, you got enough resources to set this guy up. You don't have to worry about your daughter if you just support her. And so her, her father concedes and uh, Lucy's very happy about this. Um, and she marries Henry Knox. And so he's writing to uh, his wife. Yesterday, I was going to Cambridge. I met the general who begged me to return to Roxbury again, which I did. When they had viewed the works, they expressed the greatest pleasure and surprise at their situation and apparent utility to say nothing of the plan, which does not escape their praise. So here's a young man who runs into General Washington and General Lee, who have uh, arrived in Cambridge just a couple days earlier. And uh, Washington was sworn in as commander of chief, and they're inspecting um, the works and trying to get a lay of the land. And they run into Henry Knox, and um, and as he says, he gives them a tour of of the um, of of the sites in Roxbury, and they're very happy with with what they see. They're happy with with the um, with the fortresses, and they're also very happy 
with their with their young guide. And this is the moment that Henry Knox and George Washington meet. And of course, they will form a friendship and support each other, not only through the entire war, um, but then when Washington becomes our first president, Henry Knox becomes his first secretary of war. So uh, President Washington has a very small cabinet, only four members of which Henry Knox is one. A few days later, again, Henry's writing to Lucy and he returns. He's he returns the opinion. He's very happy with these new generals. The new generals are of infinite service in the army. They have to reduce the men to order almost from perfect chaos and think they are in a fair way of doing it. Our troops still affect to hold the army besieged and will effectively continue to do so. So we've got a, got a little bit of mutual admiration going on between um, the new generals and young Knox. Dr. Uh, Jeremy Belknap, who will later found the Massachusetts Historical Society, um, is a, a minister of um, one of the churches in town. And um, he uh, these two slides uh, describe what he sees when he goes through Roxbury. Um, obviously, it's not the full letter, but it will give you an idea of how the town of Roxbury has changed as a result of the siege. Nothing strikes me with more horror than the present condition of Roxbury. That once busy, crowded street is now occupied by a picket guard. The houses are deserted, the windows are taken out, and many shot holes visible. Some have been burnt and others pulled down to make room for the fortifications. A wall of earth is carried across the street to William's old house. There, there is a formidable fort mounted with cannon. The lower line just below where the George Tavern stood, a row of trees, roots, and branches lies across the road there, and the breastwork extends to Lamb's Dam, which makes a part thereof. I went round the hole and was so near the enemy as to see them, though it was foggy and rainy, relieve their sentries, which they do every hour. So this is in the fall of 1775, and it's a commentary from a civilian about the impact of all of these military fortifications um, being thrown up in the community. By the time the siege is lifted, the Continental Army will build 223 new buildings and that's in addition to converted uh, barns and homes um, that were taken over. Many of those homes were homes of loyalists. And uh, of those 223 buildings, about 132 of them were used for, for barracks. Here in the middle of November, again, Knox writing to his wife, Lucy, um, she he gives, gives her a little bit of a hint as to an assignment that he's been given by General Washington. Keep up your spirits, my dear girl. I shall be with you tomorrow night, and don't be alarmed when I tell you that the general has ordered me to go westward as far as Ticonderoga. About three weeks' journey. Don't be afraid. There's no fighting in this case. I'm going on business only. Uh, turns out that three weeks was huge. <laughs> underestimation of how much time this was going to take. Um, so so um, Knox gets his orders from General Washington on November 16th, and he doesn't come back to headquarters until the following January. When he leaves, he is doing this as a civilian volunteer. And while he's en route to Ticonderoga, his commission arrives at headquarters in Cambridge. And so it's not until Knox gets back that, that Washington is able to give him um, his, his commission as a colonel. The trail itself, the Knox Trail, which commemorates um, Knox bringing all of, all of these uh, 59 cannons from Lake George and from uh, Fort Ticonderoga, um, was commemorated as a trail back in the back in the twenties, and it goes through two states, um, New York, and uh, almost the entire length of Massachusetts. And up here in the corner, you can see the types of um, markers that just 
tells anyone who's following the trail um, what happened at this particular spot. And this particular one is uh, in Roxbury and it's one of the, one of the newer ones. James Thatcher was doctor and um, you can see this is from um, February. So we're getting a little bit closer to, to um, the cannons have, uh, have arrived in Framingham. And now that we have all these cannons, um, a bunch of generals are trying to decide how they want to deploy them, how they want to implement them, and what's the best use of them. And basically, it's decided that um, they should fortify the heights of Dorchester and impose the cannons upon that shipping lane, which will cut off any um, any supplies that are coming into the into the town of Boston. And the cannons have enough that there's enough height that if they want to, they can also bombard Boston. Um, but like the fortification that they put on the heights of Charlestown, they want to do this very secretively so that the, the British regulars and the British Navy don't actually find out about it. Um, so this is one of the comments on the orders that have come out. So James Thatcher is a doctor and he writes in early Feb uh, late February, our regiment, according to orders, marched to Roxbury and took quarters in the large elegant house formerly belonging to Governor Shirley. So yes, this is the Julie Eustace house for those of you who recognize it. Orders have been received for surgeons and mates to prepare lint and bandages to the amount of 2000 for fractured limbs and other gunshot wounds. So this is one indication um, that the that the that the generals are very aware that to do this is an incredibly dangerous thing and a lot of people have the potential to be hurt and harmed. Um, preceding the actual movement onto the heights of Dorchester, the the remember the fortifications that I mentioned and showed you on that first map. Um, from Leechmere Point, from Cobble Hill, which is one of the high grounds in what today is Somerville, and from Lamb's Dam, which is in Roxbury, for actually three nights, they bombard Boston. And Knox reported that on the 4th, that three of the batteries fired into Boston, um, and you can see the numbers there, from Lamb's Dam, 11 shells and 80 balls, from Leechmere Point, two shells and 46 balls, and from Cobble Hill, zero shells and 18 balls. So you can see um, that there's a lot of our, of our rather uh, sparse supplies being spent on this. Um, it's sending up a huge racket. And of course, the British in Boston are not sitting quietly, are not sitting dormant, and so they are firing their cannons um, back, um, particularly um, at the uh, towards towards Leechmer Point. The other thing I want to point out is is this date, March fourth. So, like, um, like the Battle of Bunker Hill, the troops are going to go into place in the darkness of the night, and when the sun rises. The plan is there'll be a fort where there was nothing the night before, just like back in June in uh, Charlestown. So when the sun rises, it will be March 5th. And that date was chosen very consciously because that is the anniversary of the Boston Massacre. And so there's a very conscious decision to use the anniversary of the Boston Massacre as a way to mo motivate the provincial troops and they kind of use it as a battle cry um, and to inspire the the foot soldiers to remember to remember um, the Boston massacre. <clears throat> so the biggest difference between oh here are the um, here are the batteries from Cobble Hill and Leechmer Point. So the biggest difference between trying to quickly build a fort overnight in Charlestown in June, and trying to quickly build a fort overnight on the Dorchester Peninsula in early March is that the ground is still frozen. 
So the techniques that were used in Charlestown, which was to send a bunch of farmers in the middle of the night with pickaxes and shovels and to dig up the earth and pile the earth up and then you have constructed a readout is not going to work in this season uh, for two different reasons. One, if you look at Charlestown here, the approach to the Charlestown Peninsula is on the back side of Charlestown from where Boston is, right? So it's pretty easy to come from Cambridge and, and um, Mystic without really drawing the attention of the British ships and the British soldiers as long as you're quiet, okay? That is not the case for Dorchester. Uh, you, the, the, the path to get you onto Dorchester is on the Boston side of the peninsula, okay? And then the other is that the ground is frozen. So if you were able to, to dig in with picks, axes, and shovels, it's going to be a lot slower. And because you're on the Boston side, you're completely exposed. So the problem becomes of how do you do this while protecting the soldiers who are doing the digging um, from the site and from the guns of the British in Boston. And they come up with a few different techniques to basically uh, build wooden blinds off site and bring them to that, that land bridge that connects it to, um, that connects between uh, the Dorchester Peninsula or Dorchester Heights as we call it today and the town of, and the town of Roxbury. And Francis and chandeliers are two of the, of the handful of things um, that were used. So a blind causeway shall be thrown up if possible while the others work, while the other work is about, especially on the Dorchester side and the nearest to the enemy's guns and most exposed. We calculate, I think, that 800 men would do the whole causeway with great ease in a night if the march is not got bad to work again and the tide gives no great interruption. Um, so the fan scenes are these, these bundles of, of uh, sticks or um, sometimes they could be straw and you'll see that we, we use both. And then the chandeliers are the, these, these uh, um, they, they kind of look like, a, like an H or half an H, maybe like an F on its side. That's probably the best way to describe it, a big capital F flipped over on its side. And so they basically create this open structure and then, and then the soldiers um, can simply lay the fascines into the chandeliers. And if you line them up one right after another, they're creating um, this wall of timber that they can use as a shield or a blind. And it's tall enough that the soldiers and the oxen and the carts um, can move behind it and, and be unseen. And again, meanwhile, there's all this cannonading going on um, from the different batteries. And here we see in the orders to General, General Ward, from Washington to General Ward, that he specifically wants um, Knox to be there. I shall desire Colonel Gridley and Colonel Knox to be over tomorrow to lay out the works. And so these are the two men that he trusts the most with his engineering. Um, this is another technique that, that was used. These are called gabions, and you can see that they're giant baskets and um, the gabions could be made off site. And then once they're broken through the frozen ground, the ground can be thrown into the gabions and they become a wall. The other thing that can be put into the gabions is, the, is stones. And of course, New England, um, for very long times, they use stone walls as a way of delineating um, between property lines. And so there, there is an abundance of stone which can be moved on site and which can be um, used from the actual peninsula itself. So these are the gabions. This particular photograph is from reenactors at Fort Ticonderoga, but the same thing was used at Dorchester Heights. And the fourth thing that was used was simply barrels. So barrels, um, rows of barrels could be filled with earth where they were placed around the works. They represented not only the appearance of strengthening the works, but the real design was that in the case of the enemy made an attack, 
to have to roll them down the hill. They would have to descend with such increasing velocity as must have thrown the assailants into the utmost confusion and have killed and wounded great numbers. So something as simple as a barrel, and of course in a port town, there's an abundance of barrels um, in and around holding lots of cargo um, that can be that can be emptied out. So the stores for the army can be emptied out of the barrels and the barrels can be filled up with, uh, with earth and stone to make a wall. Um, and then the wall can be tipped over to, to make a, um, a rolling projectile. Uh, James Thatcher again, <clears throat> on passing Dorchester Neck, I observed a vast number of large bundles of screwed hay arranged in a line next to the enemy to protect our troops from raking fire, to which we should have been greatly exposed. While passing and repassing, the carts were still in motion with material. Some of them had made three or four trips. On the heights, we found two forts in considerable forwardness and sufficient for the defense against the small arms and, and grape shot. So um, James Thatcher arrives um, with the reinforcement troops about four o'clock in the morning on, on the 5th. And here we get um, one, one um, primary source of someone who's, who, who witnesses it. And here we have a number. Um, this is a great letter from General John Thomas um, to his wife, Hannah. It's a very long letter. I've just taken um, a few paragraphs um, and you can, you can tell that these two have been married for quite some time. And then after this, I'll share a letter between Henry and his wife. And you can tell they're still kind of newlyweds when, when you compare the two letters. Um, so General Thomas to his wife, Hannah. Dear Mrs. Thomas, we have for some time been preparing to take possession of Dorchester Point, and last Monday night, about seven o'clock, I marched with about 3,000 picked men besides 360 ox team and some pieces of artillery. Two companies of the train teams were laden with materials for our works. About eight o'clock, we ascended the high hills, and by daylight, got two hills defensible. About sunrise, the enemy and others in Boston appeared numerous on the tops of houses and the wharfs, viewing us with astonishment, for our appearance was unexpected to them. The cannonading which kept up all night from our lines at Lamb's Dam and from the enemy lines likewise at Leachmere Point now ceased from those quarters, and the enemy turned their fire towards us on the hill, but they soon found it was little effect." I've had very little sleep or rest this week, being closely employed by day and night, but now we think we are well secure. I write in haste, thinking you may be anxious to hear as there is much firing this way. And then in the postscript, he says, your son, John, is well and in high spirits. He ran away from Oakley privately on Tuesday morning and got by the sentries and came to me on Dorchester Hill, where he has been most of the time. I like how he says, your son, not our son, not my son, and young John is only 10 years old. So basically he followed his father um, and all the action um, onto the Dorchester Peninsula. And so again, this is just a couple days after um, all, the, um, all the action of, of building up the, the, um, the defenses. So he's got a minute and he's going to write his wife. By comparison, um, this is one of the shorter letters that Knox sends to Lucy. And so I've actually included the whole letter here. And you can see there's a slight difference in tone um, from this husband to his wife. My only love. I received your letter by my brother, which gave me the most sensible pleasure. I tenderly ask you what has become of me. No evil has happened, but an excessive hurry of business has prevented my pain, my Lucy, that tribute of affection, which is so justly her due. The ladies, you say, told you of strange movements indeed. I know not how to clearly account for them. Certainly it is they, the enemy, are packing up and going off bag and baggage. How far or where is yet uncertain. If to New York, my dear Lucy, must prepare to follow them. As we are citizens of the world, any place will be our home and equally cheap. 
and most earnestly wish to see you, but believe I shall not have you pleasure till I've been in Boston, which I fully expect in the course of two or three days, whether as at present or reduced to a heap of rubbish is uncertain. God preserve you, my greatest earthly blessing. H. Knox, kiss your heavenly babe and bless it for me. Are there any questions at this point? Sean, are there any questions from the chat? Yeah, sorry, just pulling myself off mute there. Um, got a couple questions. So uh, again, thank you very much, Maria, for that informative presentation, especially getting to kind of go through and read all the letters. Um, you know, obviously puts that that human spin on an event that, that took a place a while ago. So it's, it's great to, you know, evoke that emotion. Um, so... <clears throat> I will get right to the questions here. Um, so some of these did come in before the presentation. So we'll go through those first and then we'll get to the ones that just came in. Um, so first up, uh, did Henry Knox study the theory slash tactics of a specific artillery specialist to be in charge of the artillery for the Continental Army? So Knox got most of his artillery knowledge and really military knowledge um, from reading um from reading the books in his bookstore, in all honesty, he was part of the artillery train of Boston, which today we know as, as the ancient and honorable artillery. And so uh, with that, he was able to get some rather practical hands-on experience. And so it's really a combination of the two um, that, so the, the book learning from reading great military historians um, to, to a little bit of hands-on and, and learning in his own um, militia unit, which is an artillery unit. Great. Thank you. Um, so I know you talked about this a little bit, but feel free to elaborate here. Um, someone wanted to know a little bit more about the equipment and techniques used to move such heavy equipment. Yeah. So obviously this is before the days of hydraulics and forklifts and that sort of thing. And so, um, what they're really using to move these cannons around um, is is um, is basic wood and mechanics, and so to for 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 building the sleds, um, they had to be made by hand, um, and and they were they were hired um, they hired professionals to do that, and. Um, one of the things that happens is um, when Knox goes to Albany, he gets some advice from um, Schuler, and um, and and basically Schuler says, no, 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 you 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 can't pay that much. You gotta <laughs> you gotta bring the prices down, or there because there's just not enough money for that. Um, and then the other thing that's worth pointing out is that is that a lot of these carriages that carry the cannons um, are custom made, and um, and sometimes um, to to hire a wheelwright to build a, a, a carriage for a cannon, it can cost almost as much to make the carriage as it does to make the cannon. Um, and the other thing that if you're the enemy and you want to destroy their cannons, uh, one of the easiest things to do is just to burn their carriages because they're a combustible material and... Um, and the cannons are useless without them. Uh, another thing you can do, um, which were done to many of the cannons uh, that were left by the British regulars in Boston, is that the trunnions were broken. Um, and without the trunnions, it's almost impossible to aim the cannons, so it renders them pretty much useless. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so what what became of some of these artillery pieces? Where, where did they end up? What happened to them? Yeah, so so most of them get packed up uh, with the Continental Army and go to New York, um, and they get used throughout the war. Um, cannons are are slow to move, and so if um, if there is any sort of battle where um, where any one side is forced to flee quickly, 
often the cannons are left behind. Um, we saw that at, um, at Bunker Hill, there were only a handful of cannons that were that were brought over to the Charlestown Peninsula, and only one of them was able to be uh, taken off safely uh, by the provincials. And so these cannons actually end up going back and forth between the two armies throughout the the entire war, and and um, I I find it hard to believe that anyone ever knows how many cannons they have at any one given point because they always seem to be leaving them behind and re and then being reclaimed by the other army. So that was one of Knox's um, challenges through the war was to was to keep track of his many of his cannons as as he could. You know, just got to keep that inventory right. Um. <laughs> All right, so did have just a kind of a couple general questions speaking to this specific idea, but basically, how did the British regulars not pick up on the fact that there's like this large train of artillery coming? And then how did they not notice when it's all being built? Like, where was the breakdown? How how were they caught so off guard? Yeah, so basically it's, it's that combination of the distraction of the cannons for a couple of nights, and then the the building of that wall, that blind of the fascine and chandeliers, um, that is high enough that they're able that the provincials are able, the continental army is able to build it as they go, and then move behind it without being distracted, uh, without being detected. And, and again, a lot of it has to do with that their attentions were really drawn more, more towards the cannons. Great. Thank you. Um, so a couple general questions about like Rockberry. Um, so first, and I'll, I'll ask this in a couple parts. First, um, I know that you showed one, um, which was great, but uh, are there any sign markers in Roxbury, specifically speaking to like where Boston Neck was? Do you know if there are any markers in Roxbury that speak to where that would have been located? Um, yeah, so I, sh I showed the the one that I managed to find a picture of, um, and I think that is actually on Fort Hill. Um, but if someone else knows more specifically, feel free to throw that into the chat. Um, that's the only one that I know of, of that style. Occasionally, you will find um, some of the old bicentennial, you know, uh, the kind of the small, about the size of a computer screen slate with white text. And some of those are scattered around the city that, that um, talk about um, different things related to the, the revolution and the siege. And of course, on Dorchester Heights, there's um, a replica cannon. Um, Dorchester Heights is currently being rehabilitated and there's a new um, exhibit that's kind of wrapped around the construction fence, which talks about uh, the siege. And then up at, um, and, um, and then up at Fort Hill, I believe there are a couple markers themselves um, referring to the fort. And there might be something in um, near the Dillaway Thomas house in, in John Elliott Square. And then one of the houses that, that I showed you, the Shirley Eustace house, um, that is a historic home, which is, which is open to the public as well. Yeah, definitely worth a visit. Um, and, I, and I can say too, there are the old, uh, the post road markers they kind of scattered. I just know that because I'm currently in Alston and there's one right across the street from me. So I see it a lot. <laughs> um, but I know that those are there too. Um, do you, and if you don't know, this is totally fine, but do you know where roughly the location, someone was asking about uh, Lamb's Dam, where that you know, in Roxbury was located? Yeah, I've, I've, that's something that's been bugging me. And, and all I can do is, is guess a little bit. And they talk about, um, they, they talk about a, uh, a fortification line, the lower fortification line, um, which goes from the tavern to Lamb's Dam. There, there does appear to be a little bit of a construction here, but there's no water there. So that doesn't make any sense to me. And so if I go over to this lower line, I can see that there's um, an inlet right here and a particular point associated with that. Um, so that is one potential guess. 
And that would probably be judging by how like it's about halfway between Fort Hill and Dorchester Heights. That's probably about um, where the old colonial um, packing plant is not too, too far um, from where Massachusetts Avenue crosses Melanie and Cass. Um, the other possibility is that it's over here along um, Stony Brook. And Stony, Stony Brook is still there. You just can't see it. It runs through a culvert that goes under Columbus Avenue. Um, and there does appear to be a, a bit of a structure right here. Um, so that's the other possibility that was somewhere along what today is current day Columbus Avenue. That's a very long way of saying I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> but you did your due diligence. Which you're right. <laughs> um, all right. So we got time for just a couple more here. So I'll do some some quick ones, I think. Um, do you know where uh, Lucy would have been when she was receiving these letters? Like, where was she living at the time? Yeah, she was in Watertown. Nice. Not too far away, then. That's good. Not too far away. Um, and then, do you know, um, by the time of the siege at, uh, by the time of, you know, um, Henry Knox bringing the cannons to Dorchester Heights, um, were there soldiers from outside of New England with Washington by this time? Or was it still more of a kind of local um, group of men within the Continental Army? So it, so it's very much all of New England is is represented all of New England. Um, <clears throat> so Maine was part of Massachusetts. Um, you had troops from Massachusetts, Northern Massachusetts, which today we call Maine, New Hampshire, um, Connecticut under the leadership of, of um, shows up under the leadership of uh, General Putnam and then um, Rhode Island and kind of towards the Cape and the, the South shore are really focused in on on Roxbury, and they're so so kind of those who came from the north are stationed on the north side of, of Boston, and those who came from the south are kind of stationed on the on the south side of Boston. Um, I don't know the exact date, but I do know riflemen from um, Pennsylvania and Virginia are, are eventually show up, and they are utilized mostly to go north. Um, so they'll go with Arnold on the uh, trek up to Montreal. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I know we did have a couple more, but in the interest of time, I know that Maria, you had a couple more things you wanted to share. Uh, so please feel free to go ahead and do that. And I can drop some of these links that you're going to talk about in the chat. Great. Um, so one of the things I want to encourage you to do is to continue your discovery and um, these are uh, some of the resources that I use to pull this information together. Um, so the Revolutionary War Lives uh, and Letters of uh, Lucy and Henry Knox by Philip Hamilton. Henry Knox, Visionary General of the American Revolution by Mark Plus is a good overview of Knox, uh, particularly um, his, his revolutionary service. Um, and then the other thing that I'll make a big plug for, I've used this a lot. This is um, George Washington Historic Resource Study available at Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters. It is hefty. If you print it out, it will take an entire ream of paper, um, but it's a wonderful book and you can get it for free. And um, uh, J.L. Bell has done a really good job at laying out exactly what's in each chapter. So if you don't feel like tackling all 600 pages of it, you can focus in on the one piece that you're particularly interested in. And he does a great job at not only describing um, how the fortification of Dorchester Heights works, um, but he also does some things like talk a lot about um, who are the people who are in and out of headquarters. And he's got... Um, um, some some really good information on how um, African Americans um, were 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 allowed to fight, were not allowed to fight, and how that went back and forth, and just when and why. Um, and then some of our own resources at um, the National Parks of, of uh, Boston. Um, there's a web page for Dorchester Heights. Um, and a siege map, which is one of our story maps. And here's a screenshot from the siege map. And you can see that map that I was using and it's overlaid 
with a contemporary map of Boston. And then there's a series of um, points of interest. And if you click on them, they'll give you a quick thumbnail sketch of, of what's going on at that particular point of interest. And you'll also see there's a read more tab. And so that will bring you to um, a larger explanation of what was going on at that particular uh, at that particular spot, at that particular point point of interest. And so it's a good, it's a it's a good little resource um, that you can get to just by going to mps.gov slash BOST, B-O-S-T. And so the last thing I want to do is just encourage you to come visit. Um, we tell the story of the Siege of Boston and the story of, of um, the Battle of Bunker Hill every day at our resources. So come on down and see the real thing at, um, at Bunker Hill and at Dorchester Heights. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maria. Really appreciate that very informative presentation. And with that, I can uh, turn it back over to Karen. Oh my goodness. I'm just soaking it all in. <laughs> Usually at this time, I'm always like starstruck by the history and also the wonderful presentation you just gave. There's so much. Um, and also everyone got really into it. And unfortunately you couldn't see it, Maria, but everyone's just popping in about uh, where <laughs> they're great. from and also how they're connected. Uh, I saw some people from, one was from General Washington, like they're from the Berkshires. And so a lot of it in there which was very Yay. cool um Yay. also giving some people a little time to click just in case it disappears when when we leave so i want to make sure people have time if they want to click on the links now so they come on your screen before our webinar goes away um what a way to start our season honestly i i can't i'm giddy uh, <laughs> thank you so much and um our next one will actually i believe Ranger Sean is presenting it, so a familiar voice, and it'll all be about um, John Brown's Boston, which I can't wait. So everyone, bundle up, you know, or invest in some salts and a shovel. Um, I don't know if our snow is going anywhere. Um, I think it's just here to stay, guys. So thank you so much, and we'll see you back in two weeks. And Maria, thank you. This was wonderful. Thank, thank you so much for having me and we'll see you in a couple of weeks for Sean's program. Later. Bye. Bye.